So I'm thrilled to be here today. Really, I want to spend some time telling you some stories. I've had a very fortunate life that involved having to date the chance to travel throughout the world um, and living overseas as a child. And I've learned a lot from those experiences, and I know I have a lot more to learn, but I wanted to share a little bit about that today and some of the amazing people that I have, in particular, come to know uh, throughout Asia and Africa. So I'm going to start by sharing some simple life lessons that, for me, um, represent some guiding, guiding principles. And they're very simple, but I assure you there's a lot more depth to, to each of these that I'm going to share some stories about. So simply be curious, recognizing that there's always something to learn. Never assume that you know all there is to know about anything. Second, be kind. Okay, simple enough, but it goes beyond just being proactively nice to the people around you. It means recognize that even the most insignificant thing that you think doesn't matter can actually have a really big impact on somebody else. Be aware, and this is core to the work that I'm doing now, and we'll talk more about this, but this is about pausing to reflect. Understanding what's happening inside yourself and outside yourself, and the impact that that may have on, on others. And finally, being committed to purpose. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like as you each discover what you have as your unique wisdom, as individuals with a very distinct life circumstances to date and how that wisdom can be a gift to other people. All right, so being curious. When I was 10 years old, um, my father was a Navy test pilot and we were stationed in the Philippines. And for two years I lived in the Philippines, um, primarily on a military base. Now, I don't know if it was my cultural curiosity or something my parents just signed me up for, but at some point I ended up in a two-week exchange program in a little fishing village, one sort of like this, um, living in a tiny bamboo nipa hut with a Philippine family and all by myself. So I was terribly shy in these days. Here I was, nine years old, but I was also terribly polite. I did what I thought I was supposed to do and tried my best to get through what was initially a, quite a terrifying experience. I ate the food that was offered to me. My mom said, whatever it is, just smile and say you really love it. And they were these little itty bitty teeny tiny red hot dogs. And I went, mmm. And so they thought I loved it so much I had the same thing every single night fed to me. <laughs> I, you know, I, I went to school with the little girl who who, by the way, only spoke Tagalog. I did not speak a lick of Tagalog. She did not speak any English. So we really just sort of communicated by hand signals and um, you know, just the way kids do as, as you play and explore things. I went to school with her. I marveled at the fact that they had almost no books. They, the teacher was using a piece of wood that was painted black and, and written on the chalk as their blackboard. Um, I had to use the latrine. They didn't have toilets inside the house. Um, although I was always quite shocked when um, the little girl who was with me would just sort of squat down in the bushes as we were wandering and thought nothing of it, and that was just sort of, sort of how things were done. In the afternoon, we, we drank coconut from um, the husk. We played with seashells and sticks in the water, and at night we sat on the steps next to this little um, single general store in the area. It was really the only one that had a light bulb and uh, a radio and, and danced to Michael Jackson. It was 1984. <laughs> so it was one of the most joyous experiences that I had as I really reveled in this sense of community. People spent time together. They hung out at each other's houses. We played it. We were free and we were safe. And so as the end of our um, week came together, I knew now it was time for this little girl to come to my house. And I was actually very excited about it. I wanted to show her my room and my toys and the stereo and all these things that I thought she would enjoy because they were modern conveniences that she didn't have access to. And yet, she didn't. She hated it. She was homesick. She was terrified. She didn't understand how the radio was here and music was coming out of someplace else in the house and the toilet was scary to her as it flushed and she, she was homesick and she didn't like my life 
And somehow, as I looked through my culture, uh, through her eyes, you know, the sort of sterile floors and clean house started to take on a, a less than welcoming um, environment. And I realized at that moment that I couldn't necessarily assume that I would know what somebody else wanted. I knew that I'd grown up in a place of privilege and somehow it came with some responsibility that there were disparities in this world, but I didn't necessarily know, now know what it was that I was supposed to do about it or even that I could assume that I knew what somebody else wanted. This was the moment at which I learned for the very first time that it was absolutely essential to be curious, to be open, to be open to the fact that everything that I thought I knew might actually be turned on its head. And this wasn't actually the first time this would happen to me. So fast forward 15 years and you see me coming back to the US, graduating from school, going to college, studying foreign affairs, becoming an investment banker, traveling around the world internationally, and then finally going to business school up here at Dartmouth. So while I was at business school, I came um, to this, this next really critical point of uh, understanding. And it was during a trip we'd taken as a team of business school students to Vietnam to go consult on a particular um, corporate assignment. But on the weekends, we would travel out into the countryside, and we went up to this northern village right on the border with China called Sapa. We stayed in this really pretty hotel, and every day we would walk out into the surrounding area to go explore and go to the, the local marketplaces. So each day we would step out from the hotel, there were these groups of Hmong girls who were waiting for us. And they're just so joyous and happy, and they would talk to us and tell us their name and, and grab onto us and show us around. And you know, each one of us ended up having sort of one girl sort of affixed to us for the rest of the day. Um, and uh, one of the little girls that kind of made her my, um, my uh, uh, um, partner was named Me. They asked, they actually spoke pretty um, decent English because they spent a lot of time intersecting with uh, other tourists. So we could have basic conversation. Well, one morning we went outside again and there they were again and we waved and you know, tried to make our exit and, and keep going. And um, one of the little girls said, hey, what's my name? And I said, oh, you're me. You know, this is the little girl I've been spending a lot of time with. And she nodded and smiled. And then another girl said, what's my name? And then another one said, what's my name? And suddenly, I, you know, I'm already really bad with names, but this was an impossible situation. I, I had no idea. I, I couldn't answer their question. And soon, one little girl's face just screwed up into this horrible scowl. And she started yelling at me in a language that I obviously could not understand, but I certainly did understand what she was trying to get across as a message. Um, I, you know, I felt kind of awkward. I tried to apologize and began again to try and make my exit. When me grabbed me, you know, not so fast, pulled me back over there and began in this dialogue with the other girl who was really angry. And they started yelling at each other. And then they started crying. And I'm watching this whole thing thinking, you know, what did I do? Well, shortly into this episode, um, I'm watching them, they're, they're crying, and then things start to level off, and, and then they, they, they drag me, well, they, I, actually, here I am curious, I, I'm taking my first lesson to heart, I'm curious. They walk me over to a wall, and we sit down, and one of the most beautiful exchanges begins to ensue. One girl sitting on the side, and one girl sitting on the side of me, and this one here begins to sing, and then the next one sort of sings in response and then the next one sings, and then the other one sings again, and soon they're crying and hugging, and, and I knew everything was fine. So what was going on here? What I quickly realized is that these little girls of the indigenous um, Hmong ethnic group were very much discriminated against by the local Vietnamese community. In fact, they didn't actually even speak Vietnamese because um, they spoke English because they were more inclined to interact with tourists. But as 
the days had worn on and we saw how they were treated by locals oftentimes when we would go in to eat lunch and we'd invite them to come in with us, the shopkeepers would chase them away and they were very much, um, they, they, were, they were very much discriminated against. And so for them, having a foreigner actually know their name, that was validation, that was recognition, that was acknowledgement that they were somebody. So, as I was sitting there with these two girls, the other one whose feelings I had hurt, you know, had forgiven me, and she went back to her group of friends, and me was sitting there, and she pulls out a little bag, and she opens them, it up, and she shows me the only thing in her sack is a stack of very well-worn postcards. So we pull them out, and she says, read to me. So she can speak English, but she can't read it. And I start reading them, and I recognize these are all the international travelers who over the years have met me and have gone the distance to send her a postcard once they got home. Here's someone from Australia saying, me, I hope you're doing well. I wish you and your family the best. The next one is from a couple in England. The next one from a woman in Canada. To her, these are her prized possessions that she has kept with her by her heart and every day looks and reads at them as validation that she is loved and she is cared for. So as she's showing me and I'm reading these postcards, she said it says that this is my real important friend. And she, she says this person came to visit my village, which is three hours away from where we were. And she hands me this picture and I'm looking at it and I think, I know this woman. This happens to be another classmate at the business school where I was going, a year ahead of me, who must have come there for a consulting assignment like I did, that must have gone on vacation to this village and happened to have met me. But in this case, she took the time to go with me and see her village and stay with her overnight, which had meant the world to her. So I was able to say to me, do you want to write her a letter? I can send her a postcard. Her jaw just dropped. She, I don't think she ever thought she would have the capacity to communicate again with these people who meant so much to her. So we got to sit there and write a letter, and I actually got to hand deliver it back to this student to let her know that her simple act of kindness had meant so much to another person. So what I learned through my own mistake of forgetting a name and my subsequent redemption in helping her write this letter was never underestimate your impact on another person. Simply be kind. What you might find to be the most seemingly insignificant thing can have the most extraordinary impact on another person. This was, I think as well, my point of beginning to become aware, my third point. All right, this was my business school experience. So one day, on my way driving um, to business school, I suddenly found myself driving into a ditch. Now, I see my husband is here. I don't think I've told him the story because he likes to tease me about being a bad driver. <laughs> and the thing is, I really am not a bad driver. I, I promise you. It's just that I'm not very good at always being aware while I'm driving. So this was the problem. And so here I was driving along, I've got this to-do list going on, running through my mind right as I'm running into a ditch. And I'm sitting there suddenly realizing, I'm off the road, I'm not making it to the class I was already late to. And um, it could have been a lot worse. Luckily, no one was hurt, neither was my car, and neither was I. But this was um, a really important um, wake-up call to, well, wake up. So shortly thereafter, I began meditating. And this was something that was critically important for my own well-being, my stress, my sense of understanding. Um, but it's also become very essential to my work. I started out with looking at um, self-awareness simply as a tool for my own stress. But I began to understand how critical this was to anyone who wanted to create change in the world. So my organization, Global Grassroots, it works with some of the most vulnerable and marginalized people globally. Um, we work with survivors of genocide, widows who have eight children, um, subsistence farmers who are living on $2 a day, girls who are orphans um, and, and leading their child-headed households. These are 
individuals that have seen extraordinary violence, except that they also have incredible ideas for social change. They're taking care of their communities. They're rebuilding their communities. And they know what needs to happen, but they have never had the opportunity for the resources and the, the training to help them know how to go about doing it. So Global Grassroots identifies among them these change agents with ideas and provides them with training. Training in three things. We do mind-body trauma healing work, so mindfulness work that helps you address stress and trauma. What we call conscious leadership skills, which is a type of self-awareness that I'm going to talk to you about in a second. And then social entrepreneurship skills to help them start their own nonprofits. So one of the, um, I'm going to teach you about one of the, the practices that I use with some of our change agents. I want each of you to think about a time recently, and I know that we all have these experiences, where you experience like a moment of anger, frustration, irritation at somebody, or embarrassment or awkwardness. And just remember what that felt like. And think about what you did in that moment. Usually, we take it out on somebody else. You know, we snap at somebody, you know, we, we say something later we wish we hadn't, but um, most of us that has, most of us have had a moment like that. Um, so what we talk about in terms of being aware is that once you can, it's really hard to catch yourself in the process of feeling that irritation and then reacting. But if we practice just noticing and taking three breaths, the minute you feel really angry, just, and I guarantee you, if you're in an argument with someone and you just stop and go, Something's going to shift really quickly. <laughs> but for you, you're more likely to understand what's going on, and you're less likely to actually hurt somebody in the process. So we teach everyone this practice of just taking three breaths. So why? It, what's the big deal? This sounds pretty simple. All right, so I was teaching a class with a number of my change agents in Rwanda, and one of the, um, we taught this practice, and then I asked them, you know, how's this working in your life? And one of the women raised her hands, and she said, well, I went home after class, and my kids had messed up my whole house. And usually, I, I was just so angry. Usually, I just beat my children. But today, I remembered what you said, and I took three breaths, and I realized that I don't want to hit my kids. I just want them to keep the house clean. So I was able to stand there with my eyes closed and say to them, this is why I want the house clean, and I want you to clean it up right now until I, you know, I'm gonna stand here with my eyes closed until you do it. And you know what they did? And I didn't have to beat my kids today. Now for me, that was a very powerful moment. Not just because we diverted, you know, so we'd avoided some major harm of some kids, but this woman was working on the issue of domestic violence in her community. And this simple act of taking three breaths transformed the way that she was going to work with other couples in conflict, especially in teaching them how to treat their children. More than anything, she realized she needed to be the change that she wanted to see in the world. And this was her moment of transformation. So this is being aware. So the final... The final lesson is about committing to purpose. And what the stories we've told you so about, that I've told you about so far, um, really demonstrate that this all starts from within. Now, each of you has very unique wisdom within you from your own unique life experiences. And I always ask all of my change agents, because I learned so much from them, what do you know to be true? So ask yourself in this moment, what is one thing, no matter what your experience has been, one thing that you know to be true, without a doubt? You know, whether you have experienced an act of violence or witnessed bullying, or you've had the opportunity to feel included in your social environment, there are insights from your experiences that are valuable. Whether you've come from a family of privilege or you've had a lot of challenges in your life, you've learned something that you can offer to others. You might be an extrovert and you know 
well how to adapt to a new environment. So you can assist someone else in learning that. Or instead, if you've had a hard time adjusting to a new culture, then you know what that's like and you can help make it easier for the next person. So this wisdom is extremely valuable and we need to recognize that not only do we have that to offer, but every other person has that too. So when I ask my change agents what do they know to be true, here are some of the things that they have to say. Forgiveness is more powerful than punishment. You can be rich without security and peace of mind, but the poor can be free without stress. Life is short, don't pay attention to the problems you can't control. Even if you're rich and can buy nice clothes, that doesn't mean you look good. Smile to make people happy. Rich people never accept that they're rich. Sharing your problem with someone else helps you in solving it. Willingness brings change. And these are coming from some of these amazing women, many of whom have never actually ever been to school. So the final piece is about being committed to purpose. Um, what does that look like when someone's committed to purpose? Um, I want to tell you about an amazing man that I met in Eastern Chad. This is a Darfur refugee. How many of you have heard about the Darfur crisis? Okay, so a lot of you. When I first started working on this issue, Darfur is a region of Sudan where beginning the intensity of it beginning in 2003 became a genocide where the Sudanese government and their Arab militia members that they were um, arming were working to eliminate and exterminate the African tribes and um, the various ethnic groups in the western region of Darfur. Um, it was a, it's a horrible crisis and um, at, at the height of it there were 15,000 people that were being murdered every single month. And it was a systematic approach um, that uh, lasted for several years. Uh, probably, four, they, uh, es experts estimate about 400,000 people were killed and over 4 million people were displaced. My brother was a military observer in that crisis, unarmed, right there on the front lines, documenting what was unfolding and talking to me on his satellite phone nearly every day as he was witnessing what was happening. And after he came home from the crisis, we decided to go back and visit the refugee camps to understand what some of these individuals had gone through and to see how we could document their lives and share that with the rest of the world. This later became the film The Devil Came on Horseback. One of the men that I met in Konongo refugee camp in Eastern Chad was Adam Musa. He very recently finally returned home to his village, but he lived for over seven years in this camp of 15,000 people. Now, Adam is a passionate educator. He was an English teacher. His family uh, escaped at night. The Antonov aircraft came to bomb his village in the middle of the night. He had seven kids, his wife was seven months pregnant, and they knew that by daybreak, the nomad militia men would be there um, to kill everyone else in the village. So they escaped at night in darkness and ran across the border into Chad, where they over, took over a month, but they eventually traveled down and made it to this refugee camp to safety. And so while they were there, um, despite the difficulties of living in a refugee camp, Adam saw opportunity. And as an educator, he saw yet again a chance to use his purpose to make a difference. These were largely illiterate farmers that were living in the camp, and they never had a chance for an education. So he thought, this is something I can do. And he dreamed of building a human rights library right in the middle of this camp. And all he needed was one light bulb because there's no electricity in the camp at night. And once the sun goes down and it's dark, if he turned on the light, you could be sure in a camp of 15,000 people, people are going to come and find out what's going on. So he thought, if we just have the light, they will come. I'll be able to give some lectures on what he called the bad habits of his community, including domestic violence and child abuse. And if they come to a lecture, then I'd be able to provide them with materials on on human rights and, and to help to educate this illiterate population. So for most of us, if we were living in a camp like this, in refugee tents, we'd say, mm, that's a nice dream. But for Adam, he actually went ahead and made this happen. Now this here is a, a 
water rations line. Every day, the refugees have to line up and wait for the camp administrators to turn on the water. And they fill up their jug, and that's what they have to use for cooking and drinking and washing and cleaning. Not just for themselves, but their whole family. And this is in a 109 degree desert. Adam was so inspiring that he was able to convince some of these uh, refugees to donate some of their water to him and his purpose. And he dug a hole in the dirt and he began to make mud. And he took this mud and he turned them into bricks and he let them dry in the sun. And he began building his human rights library with his bare hands. After I met Adam, some of uh, my friends went out to the same camp to visit and they told me that he built a wall about this high. It had been two years. And then the rainy season came and the entire thing crumbled. But Adam went back to building his library again, brick by brick with his own bare hands. See, Adam is one of these conscious change leaders that are driven by an inner sense of purpose. And sometimes it, people like Adam simply won't stop until they know that they've made a difference. And in so doing, they inspire others to follow them. So each of you has a gift, a capability, something that you know you love to do, something you feel alive doing, something you're passionate about. Pay attention to that. That's what's going to help you find a way to make a difference. And there's many ways you can utilize those gifts to make change happen. In fact, I believe anything can be used as a lever for social change. And let me tell you one final story. <coughs> this is a picture of one of Global Grassroots Literacy Ventures. They were teaching about 1,300 women how to read, and the women were too poor to pay for their training. But the venture needed to find a way to pay their teachers' salaries. So they looked around and they said, OK, what do we have here? What's being wasted? What can we use? And they found a whole bunch of rocks and sticks broken bricks. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were looking around to look for something useful, I probably would overlook the rocks. But they found use in these. And I said to the women, okay, we know you can't afford to pay a fee to get trained to read, but just pick up a rock when you come to class and stick it in this pile. And they were teaching at night in a school, and they said, well, if your kids are coming here during the day, why don't you pick up a rock and a stick or a brick and, you know, have the kids drop it off as well. After about two weeks, they had such a huge pile of rocks and bricks they filled two dump trucks, and they sold it to a building company, construction company, as building supplies. And they bundled all the sticks, and they sold them as firewood, and um, were able to make enough money to pay their teacher's salaries. So truly, anything can be used as a lever for social change. So ask yourself, what are you good at? What is your unique wisdom? And what are your assets? Then be curious, be kind. Be aware and be committed to purpose, and you too will be able to create transformation. Thank you. So I'm happy to take some questions if anyone has any that you're wondering about. Yes. Sorry to interrupt there. Oh, yes. Jacob Mayer, Jacob here. Yes? Are you still in touch with me? Am I still in touch with me? Yeah. I sent her a letter, but I haven't received one back. But I have a feeling, well, I was there about, <coughs> it's now 12 years ago, so it's likely that she's married and has a family now, and it might be her girls that are there in the, in the uh, hotel area that uh, I might be able to find. But I'm sure, I'm sure there'd be a way of, of reconnecting with her. I, I sometimes dream about going back and finding her and finding the little girl in the Philippines that, uh, and seeing you know, where their lives have led. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> well, what happened to him, he has a very cool story too. Um, a few years later, he actually moved from that camp to another camp to find his family. So he didn't finish the, the human rights library in the first place where he was living. But the camp that he came to shortly thereafter, Human Rights Watch, had created a program where they brought a mobile library to that camp. They just happened to do that in like a bus. 
and they invited him to be the librarian. So in a sense, he got his own library. And in the meantime, he was, um, while he was trying to build his, refu his refugee library in the first camp, he had been serving, since he was one of the only people who could speak English, he was serving as the translator for a lot of the doctors that were working in the camp to help treat the various refugees. And he learned a lot about medical um, issues. So in the last year, the peace, it, you know, Darfur hasn't achieved a real comprehensive peace, but the violence has begun to subside and people have begun to return home. So he actually went home. Um, and I know this because he actually called my cell phone a couple months ago, so I am still in touch with Adam, but it, there, there, for many years I lost touch with him. Um, um, so he, he recently told me that he had had a chance to return home. But last year, because of his English speaking skills, he was invited to serve as the translator for the Darfur refugee soccer um, team who was able to travel to Iraq and play in a tournament with refugee soccer teams from all over the world. And while he was there, someone who I knew happened to have been traveling with them, didn't know my relationship with Adam, and when they discovered, sort of like I did in meeting me, that we had this common connection, they facilitated a Skype call and I was actually able to talk to Adam when he was in Iraq. And so this past, um, Two months ago, he called me to tell me that he'd made it home safely. And Adam, still the change agent that he is, discovered that there was a really big issue with malaria in his village. And so he um, had been using the money that he'd saved from his various jobs to buy malaria tablets to treat people in his village on his own, even though he's not a doctor, just using the skills that he'd learned from being a translator. And he has up to 100 people a day coming to his house He's still trying to help other people. So that's, that's sort of Adam's story. He's, he's an amazing man. Any questions in the back? He, it, I believe he, I would say he's probably in his mid-50s right now. I could be wrong, and I'd have to go back and, and see if I had documented that somewhere. He, um, he had seven children at the time that he escaped, and um, one more born in the camps, and then two twins after that. And so he's got a very large family. Um, the, I, I, I'm thinking he's, though, in his 50s, that's my guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, right in the middle. Yes, the young girls that I was speaking of were from an indigenous group called the Hmong tribes, and they typically populate the hill, the mountainous areas along the border region of Vietnam and China, and I think also in Thailand. Um, but they were not um, of the same ethnicity uh, as the Vietnamese population that was um, sort of settled in that region and um, um, control the government. So they, they still coexist, but in many ways were being discriminated against. Um, you said that you teach like your um, conscience change skills and all of that to, uh, to different like people, uh, like literate people in like different countries and stuff. And you say that they, you want them to go on and uh, make a uh, like, Nonprofit organizations out of them. How are they supposed to make nonprofit organizations without the resources that, um, for instance, you uphold? It's a very good question. How how are these groups supposed to be able to manage nonprofit organizations without resources? So the way that we work, um, you know, we're finding these groups that have ideas. It might be a group of women that want to deal with water issues, or um, a group that wants to help ensure girls stay in school. And we help them through the process of designing like the business plan for their nonprofit. And once they've developed that, and usually it takes about a year, our, our staff works like coaches and we're helping them all along the way. But it's their idea and it's their issue of priority. We never impose our own views on what they should do. But when they get a really well-designed plan, and then we fund 100% of their startup costs with a grant. So we don't, we don't even give them a loan. We just give them an award so that they can get started and they don't have to have any debt. 
that helps them buy all the supplies that they need to get started, whether that's books for reading or renting a classroom. But you're right, after they begin their work, they need to be able to sustain it. And that's why we teach these skills, like the group that used sticks and rocks and bricks to support their program. We teach them a whole range of different techniques that they can um, find resources within their own communities to help them continue their programs. Some of them do a lot, they do a lot of different things. We have one group that was making social issue films about domestic violence and doing theatrical performances in the middle of villages. To support their work, they went to some of the big international organizations and said, what issues do you care about? Would you like to commission a film from us? And so these big organizations would pay them to make small films and that's how they would use their money. Other groups would, for example, um, they would buy pigs or cows or rabbits and have a local um, families in the community agree to raise them, but then when they reproduce, they would share the offspring. Half would go to the family for this as a thank you for taking care of, the, of them, and the other half would get sold at market, and that's how they would earn their money, and they could just keep doing that over time. Lots of different skills like that, and then they're extremely resourceful, very creative ventures um, that are able to sustain themselves over time. How do you get your money if you're giving out grants? The money that Global Grassroots gets comes from um, individuals who donate to us, grants that we go and seek from bigger foundations, and then sometimes we do programs like at Dartmouth and other places for a fee where people pay to learn in our workshops, and that way then we can raise the money to give to the change agents in Africa. Yes? Uh, will you or your group, uh, Global Grassroots, will you do any work in Bangladesh at the Oh, that's a great question. Um, I know, and I did have the, the um, great privilege of having a chance to work after the earthquake in Haiti with our trauma healing work um, that we do for victims of violence tends to also be quite supportive after a disaster like what has happened in Bangladesh. Um, we, but, but most of our work is focused sort of post-conflict, post-disasters, people are rebuilding in their communities and looking for people who want to create social change. And that would be a part of the world where I would imagine there would be lots of ideas and lots of interest. Um, we are a very small organization right now. We're only in Rwanda and Uganda, and we're starting some programs in Liberia. And it costs a lot for us to bring our work into a new country and hire new staff and train them. So what we've actually done is we've created a technology platform. We put all our curriculum online, and anyone who can access the internet can now, for free, get all of our training, and they can start their own social ventures wherever they live. So we'll begin to find partnerships in places like Bangladesh and other, um, other parts of the world where they can use our resources. And then if someone does have the funding to help us go to a new place, then we'll consider it at that time. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much.